Let's look at the key principles of the Constitution, which James Madison, as that person, that delegate who took notes at the convention, and in those notes shows that these were the arguments that were made by the delegates. Founders did not intend to create a pure democracy. They looked at the physical impossibility in a vast country of setting up a pure democracy. They mistrusted popular passions, what they called a mobocracy. The intent instead was to create a republic with a system of representation, whereby extending as far as, as possible democracy, while at the same time controlling the passions of the people. Popular rule is only one element of the new government. State legislators elected senators. That's not looking at popular rule. Electors choose the president. There are two kinds of majorities, the voters at the polls and the states that have policy-making power. Judicial review is another limitation on the people's will, since the judicial review judges are not subject to election in the federal system. And the amendment process is certainly not democratic as it requires a supermajority in order to amend the Constitution. Key principles, the key principles of the Constitution are separation of powers into legislative, executive, and judicial branches. Each of them having checks and balances on the other, such as overriding vetoes, the power of veto, judicial power by the courts, and in dual federalism, the states provide a check on the federal government. The Aristotelian view of human nature says the government should improve human nature by cultivating virtue. But Madison looked at the idea that self-interest should be freely pursued, and that a government under the Aristotelian view was too strong and too dangerous and thereby restricted individual freedom. Self-interest and individual freedom are the means by which to ensure democracy. Federalism enables one level of government to act as a check on the other, and thereby the people's liberties are further ensured. Constitutional government is to respect personal liberties is a difficult question. Ratification by the conventions in at least nine states was a democratic feature but technically an illegal one since even the 13 all 13 states were not represented at the convention during ratification process after september 1787 the anti-federalists began <coughs> writing articles in newspapers stating that liberty could only be secure in small republics they looked at in big rep in large republics, national government would be distant from the people. Strong national government would use its powers to annihilate state functions. There should be many more restrictions on the government, so said the anti-federalist Publius and Mercy Otis Warren and others. Madison's response was, in the Federalist Papers, was that personal liberty was safest in large extended republics. Alexander Hamilton, in writing the Federalist Papers, made the same argument that coalitions likely were more moderate in extended republics, and it was good that government would be distant and insulated from the passions of the people. The reason for an absence of a Bill of Rights from the original Constitution goes many different ways. There were already several guarantees in the Constitution already. Habeas corpus, no bills of attainder, no ex post facto laws, guarantees of trial by jury, privileges, immunities, clauses for state laws across borders, no religious tests for holding office, the obligation of contracts regardless of where a person lived within a nation. Most states already had bills of rights, and they simply felt that there wasn't really necessary to have a national bill of rights. The intent of the Constitution was to limit federal government to specific powers, not necessarily to grant individual freedoms. But, as the argument for ratification went, there was a need for a Bill of Rights in order to get the state conventions to ratify the Constitution. The key leaders like Madison and Hamilton and others had to promise that the Congress would first 
the Congress after the Constitution was ratified would begin the process of, for, of writing a Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments of the Constitution. Of course, the big problem with the Constitution is that it was, it was written and the nation formed with slavery intact. It was impossible to argue and compromise about slavery. The southern states, the most valuable state, Virginia, would have walked away from the convention. They, they put in the three-fifths compromise that, and slavery legislation could not be regulated until 1808. Escaped slaves had to be returned to their masters. But with slavery intact and the nation formed, eventually the argument was going to come to war, which of course happened in 1861. Motives of the framers. There are those that you know that argue the economic interest. Charles Beard argued that those who own governmental debt supported the Constitution because it would guarantee the national government's right to tax and therefore pay back debt. There's no clear division along class lines because in the United States at the time we were a nation of, of gentry farmers and clear class lines between the rich and the poor were not there as they were in Europe. Economic interest played a larger role in state ratifying conventions. In favor of the ratification were merchants, urbanites, owners of western land, those who owned government debt. Opposed were those in the southern states as landowners, or excuse me, as slave owners, those who held no debt from the national government, Federalists versus the anti-federalist arguments were on ideals of liberty. Would the nation be too strong? Would it impose on individual liberty? What the framers looked at in equality is the arguments that are still made today that the government is too weak, that it bows to special interests too easily, it fosters economic inequality, but the framers are more concerned with political inequality. They, were, they felt that a weak government reduced political privilege. 